Welcome back to The Deep Dive. Today, uh, we're diving into a story from the Cold War, one that almost feels made up. The story behind the movie Bridge of Spies. Yeah, you know, it's one thing to watch a spy movie, but we're going deeper here, looking at the real events, a prisoner exchange between the U.S. and the Soviets, right at the peak of their rivalry, and it's full of surprises and driven by some pretty amazing people. It all starts in 1957 in Brooklyn, New York. We're introduced to Rudolf Abel. Uh, he's an artist living a pretty normal life on the surface, but behind the art supplies, he's got this whole other life. Abel's a convicted Soviet spy working for the KGB. And not just any spy either. We're talking sophisticated methods, like using everyday objects to hide information, even a hollowed out nickel. He would use these things to send coded messages to Moscow, which really shows how secretive and hidden espionage was during this era. It's kind of wild how something ordinary could be used for spying. So that's where James B. Donovan comes in. He's an insurance lawyer. Right. Seems pretty normal. Exactly. But he also has this past in naval intelligence going back to World War II. He even worked with the OSS, which later became the CIA. You wouldn't think an insurance lawyer would be the one dealing with Cold War espionage, would you? But Donovan's wartime experience, it gave him a unique perspective on the stakes involved in this kind of high-pressure world. And these skills, they'd become surprisingly valuable when he was asked to defend Rudolf Abel in court. Talk about a high-profile case defending a spy from the enemy right in the middle of Cold War tensions. Donovan faced a lot of public pressure, even threats, just for doing his job for upholding the U.S. legal system. And that says a lot about Donovan as a person. He could have treated it like any other case, but he was committed to a fair trial, even for someone accused of spying against America. He dove deep into legal arguments, even questioned how they got the evidence against Abel, going up against some very powerful people. He really believed in the Constitution, even when public opinion wasn't on his side. But even with his best efforts, Abel was found guilty. But here's where Donovan's dedication to due process takes an interesting turn. He argues that Abel could be valuable for a future prisoner exchange, and that really resonated with the court. And that's a key moment, Donovan's thinking ahead, seeing the bigger picture. It would have big consequences later on. Because as luck would have it, Abel would become a crucial asset in a high-stakes exchange. Talk about foreshadowing. Little did Donovan know how important his words would be. Now let's jump to 1960. Cold War tension is as high as ever, and a new face enters the scene. Francis Gary Powers, an American pilot on a top-secret mission. He's flying the infamous U-2 spy plane. Its job was to take pictures over Soviet territory. This U-2 program was top secret, essential for the U.S. to gather intel on Soviet capabilities at the time. These flights were seriously risky, flying crazy high, practically at the edge of the atmosphere over Soviet airspace with just cameras. In these missions, they were dangerous, and for Powers, it ended in disaster. His U-2 was shot down over Soviet territory. He was captured. Just like that, he became a pawn in the Cold War. The downing of Powers' U-2. It shook the U.S. government and the whole world. It wasn't just losing a pilot and a high-tech plane. It exposed the risky intelligence gathering the U.S. was doing. It made things with the Soviets even worse. Back in the U.S., you'd think James Donovan was done with Cold War drama, but that's not how this story goes. Not at all. So picture this. Donovan's at home, probably still thinking about the Abel case and everything going on in the world. Then, out of the blue, he gets a letter. It's from East Germany, supposedly from Rudolf Abel's wife. And East Germany at this point was aligned with the Soviet Union, part of the Eastern Bloc. This was more than just a letter between family. Right. The letter casually mentions contacting a lawyer named Vogel. It seemed insignificant, but it was actually a coded message. It hinted at a prisoner swap, a secret line of communication between two sides that were completely at odds. I bet the CIA was paying attention to this. Absolutely. They saw a chance here, an opening. Mm -hmm. And who better to navigate this than James Donovan? He knew the Abel case inside and out, and he had that wartime experience. He could think strategically under pressure. They brought him in unofficially to negotiate the exchange. From a quiet life as an insurance lawyer to a key player in a Cold War standoff. It's pretty remarkable. And his destination was just as symbolic Berlin. A city split in two by ideology. A physical representation of the Cold War. The Berlin Walls being built as Donovan gets there. A stark reminder of the divided loyalties and how high the stakes were. It's hard to grasp how a city could be so divided. It was a constant visual reminder of the global tension. Donovan's trip took him through these divided landscapes, showing the stark contrast between the East and West, separated not just by walls and barbed wire, but by distrust and totally different ways of life. His mission was to bridge that gap, not with construction, but with diplomacy and negotiation. 
and his first meeting, shrouded in secrecy, takes place in the Soviet embassy in East Berlin. He meets with a KGB officer. It's tense. They cautiously talk about a potential exchange. You can almost picture it. Smoke-filled rooms, whispers, the weight of history on every word. Straight out of a spy movie. After that, Donovan is sent to a lawyer named Wolfgang Vogel, who represents East Germany. And here's where things get even more complicated. Another player, another layer of complexity. Yeah, East Germany wants to use this to their advantage. They want to be recognized on the world stage. They see this exchange as a way to get the U.S. to acknowledge them, a step towards legitimacy for their government. They want to trade Abel for Frederick Pryor, an American student they've been holding. So Donovan's dealing with three different countries, all with their own agendas. The pressure must have been immense. You bet. The CIA, of course, wants powers back first. But Donovan, true to himself, he's a man of principle. He refuses to leave Pryor behind, recognizing that real people are caught in the middle of all this. He's not just following orders. He's trying to do what's right, even if it means going against his own government. Right. And he's good at negotiating. He sees the bigger picture. He knows getting both Americans back would be huge, not just for the U.S., but for the idea of diplomacy itself. Yeah. So he uses the situation, leverages East Germany's desire for recognition to try and get both powers and prior released. It's like he's playing this high stakes game, trying to outmaneuver diplomats and intelligence agencies. And it all leads to this historic exchange on a bridge that's become a symbol of the Cold War, the Gleenick Bridge, connecting Potsdam in East Germany to West Berlin. Picture it, it's a cold, gray day in Berlin, a city still recovering from the war, now divided by this wall. The Gleedic Bridge becomes the focus for this tense exchange, for the hopes of two nations and these men caught in the middle of it all. You can feel the tension, American and Soviet agents, East German representatives, and Donovan right there in this carefully planned operation. It's like a diplomatic dance with the whole world watching. On one side, you have powers completely worn down, carrying the weight of the U.S., desperate to go home. And on the other side, Abel, the Soviet spy, seemingly unemotional, his foot up in the air. And here's where Donovan's insistence on a fair trial for Abel comes full circle. Absolutely. You see, Abel, even though he was accused of spying on the U.S., had gained a certain respect for Donovan. He saw firsthand how much Donovan cared about the law, about fairness, even when it was unpopular. And, in a surprising twist, Abel refused to cross that bridge until he knew Pryor, the American student, was also being released. Wow, he was risking his own freedom to make sure the deal was kept? It shows how much influence Gonovan had, the trust he built, even with someone considered an enemy. He understood this wasn't just politics, it was about people's lives. But even so, it must have been a tense situation, knowing things could still go wrong. Oh yeah, and they almost did. Pryor's release was delayed, creating this awful weight and putting the whole exchange in jeopardy. Think about the pressure on Donovan caught between his own government, the Soviets, and the uncertainty of Pryor's release. It's like that moment when everything stops. And then finally, the news comes. Pryor is free. The exchange can go ahead. You can almost feel everyone breathe again, not just those involved, but everyone watching this whole thing unfold. The Gleenick Bridge, once a symbol of division for that short time, became a symbol of hope of what could be accomplished with diplomacy, even at the height of the Cold War. It showed everyone that communication, negotiation were still possible when the world felt like it was on the edge of something terrible. Such a powerful image, these men, pawns in this global game, walking across that bridge, going back to their countries, their freedom, thanks to the efforts of many, but especially James Donovan. Donovan came back to the U.S. a different man. His role in this exchange earned him recognition, helped people see him differently, those who had criticized him for defending Abel. It shows that doing the right thing can be tough, can be unpopular, but it can make a real difference. It sure can. Donovan's story, this whole thing really underlines how important it is to negotiate with principles, to remember the human side of even the most complex global situations. It reminds us that even when there's so much tension, dialogue, no matter how hard it is, is always an option. It really makes you think, in today's world, with all its issues and disagreements, what lessons can we learn from this incredible event? How can we, like Donovan, try to understand each other, overcome divisions, and find solutions that put human dignity and diplomacy first? That's something worth thinking about, isn't it? It really is. Feels like history can teach us a lot if we're paying attention. And that's what we try to do here on The Deep Dive. Thanks for joining us on this journey to the heart of the Cold War.